Hi, I'm Rudyard Griffiths, the host of the Monk Dialogues. What are the Monk Dialogues all about? Well, they're about creating a place for us to have a civil and substantive conversation about the big issues and ideas transforming our world. Since the US election, the Monk Dialogues has been focusing on the future of democracy. We started that conversation off last week with the Financial Times, Martin Wolf, and we're exceedingly fortunate to have on the program one of, uh, I think, our, our most thoughtful commentators on the fate and future of democracy today. We know her well as Anne Applebaum. She's the European-based staff writer with The Atlantic. She's a Pulitzer Prize-winning author. All kinds of uh, great books that are on your and my bookshelves. Uh, Gulag, that, that book that won her the Pulitzer Prize. Uh, Iron Curtain, Red Famine. And her latest book, a must read, The Twilight of Democracy. Anne is someone who uh, we've also known as a columnist uh, with the Washington Post in the past and a journalist with The Spectator and other uh, important magazines and news organizations around the world. She joins us now on the Monk Dialogues. Anne, great to have you back. Thanks for having me. Well, I'm really looking forward to uh, this conversation uh, today. You're someone who's uh, uh, been writing and thinking about uh, not just democracy, but the origins of authoritarianism, of totalitarianism in Europe especially. Uh, we want to draw on all that muscle memory and hard work to try to understand the future and fate of, of democracy uh, today and into the future. And to do that, Anne, uh, I'm hoping you'd play along with me a bit here. I, I, I really enjoyed your latest book, and I wanted to pull out a, a couple of the key quotes that I, I think help frame uh, the core ideas that, that you are bringing forward for all of us to kind of reflect on and, and discuss. So let's start off with uh, this, this quote out of the book, because I think it, it's, it's going to give our audience a sense of, of the essence of, of what you're addressing. Um, Quote, something is going on right now, something that is affecting very different democracies with very different economics and very different demographics all over the world. So, and what is that something? So the something is the, um, the change in the nature of information and the change in the nature of politics that has evolved out of that change. Um, uh, you know, when one of the theses of the book is that when you look around the world, I, I first experienced it in Poland, um, but I, I saw versions of it taking place in the United States, in the United Kingdom, in other European countries. I write a little bit in the book about Spain, but I also could have written about Turkey. I could have written about the Philippines. Um, I could have written about a lot of other countries. We see that there is a, um, a disenchantment with, with democracy and with existing democratic institutions. There's a frustration with the slowness of politics. Um, and above all, we see that there is a division in what used to be the public sphere in a lot of countries. So if there was ever something like a public space, you know, in the U.S. or in Canada or in, in, in other democracies where... Um, where, where political opponents could battle it out on some kind of even playing field or where, where arguments took place in a way that everybody was listening to both sides, that in many, many countries is now gone. Um, people now exist inside their own echo chambers. Um, they don't hear one another's arguments. And the arguments themselves have become more extreme. Um, the, 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 the nature of modern media, it's not just social media, although of course the algorithms that govern social media are an important part of it, um, but the nature of 24 hour news, the nature of um, the way we get our news on our phones, you know, without any kind of hierarchy, we get one message about mm. an advertisement for hairspray and then we get another message, which is an, something from our cousin. And then we learn about a war in Nagorno-Karabakh, the inability to put any of those things into some kind of hierarchy. All of that has meant um, that people find um, politics confusing. Um, there's a lot of noise and cacophony, um, and people want simple, straighter answers. They want to weigh through all of this information. And one of the results of that change, I think, is that is that there's a there's a disillusionment with democratic institutions of all kinds in a lot of different places. And is it, is it right to say, and I don't mean this pejoratively at all, but that we've lost a kind of an elite moderated 
public square. We've lost a conversation where information has been prioritized for the public, synthesized, and presented in ways that, that give priority to a kind of dialogue of democracy. Is that what's missing here? Some kind of critical elite function in shaping uh, the dialogue it's, of democracy? It's not even an elite function necessarily because, for example, one of the big missing pieces now in the US, but not only in the US actually, um, is that we've lost a lot of local and regional news. Um, the, the, the business model of, 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 of smaller newspapers just doesn't work anymore. And so we've seen the collapse of local media and local reporting. Um, and so people don't, you know, so it's become very easy for politicians to shift the conversation from, I don't know, how we should, should we build a road or a bridge right here? Um, and how much funding should we give to the local hospital? And conversations like that have disappeared and instead been replaced by big ideal kind of culture war arguments, um, you know, in which people's identities are at stake rather than the question of whether the, the road or the hospital should get um, more funding. So it's, it's not just the, the lack of, um, of, of, a, of, a, of a kind of curated conversation at the top. It's the, it goes actually all the way to the bottom. Um, in which people are no longer, politics is no longer about real events that happen in real life. Um, and instead, to a great degree, it's shifted into, into a completely different realm. Um, and one of the reasons why celebrities and, um, uh, you know, people who are good at social media are doing so well in, at politics in so many different places is that people no longer see why one of the people who appears on their screens um, you know, who, who, is a, who is a pop star and another person who appears on their screens who's a president, why is there, what's the difference between them? Why should one be more important than the other? Um, so it's not, it's not just an elite conversation, it's even more, that, even more that there's any separate political conversation or any sense that politics is about reality at all. Mm -hmm. And how do you respond to the argument, you know it well, that, that people will say that elites have used uh, democracy, 20, 20, late 20th century and early 21st century democracy, to exploit uh, their position of privilege for themselves. They've exploited it economically. Uh, they've exploited it in terms of trying to shape the public conversation and debate. And really, the failure of, of people turning away from democracy, of embracing populism and authoritarianism, there's an underlying validity to that to that movement on the basis of, of an elite failure to deliver growth, to deliver the things that people need to materially experience uh, a better life uh, than that, let's say, that their parents had. So even by asking that a question, you've made a big assumption about who are the elites and who are the people who are challenging these so-called elites. Um, you know, when I, when I take a step back and I look at the political argument, I mean, if we just stick to the United States, although my book is about, is about other countries as well, um, what I see is not, um, you know, an argument between, I don't know, ordinary people on one side and rich people on the other side. I see a competition between different kinds of elites. Okay. Um, and the use of, diff you know, and, and the use of different tactics, um, on the part of those elites. And I see that one elite group inside the United States, um, which has taken over a part of the Republican Party, um, has decided that it's in its interests um, to attack not just their political opponents, but the political system itself. Um, you know, as we're having this conversation, this is playing out right now um, in the aftermath of a US election um, that President Trump lost. Um, and he's seeking to use the dissatisfaction of voters and of, and of funders and others to create an anti-democratic movement that will overthrow the election, um, since that's unlikely, but that movement will then be useful in the future for other things. Who is curating, who's organizing, um, who's, who's pushing this movement? Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's an elite group. It's, it's Trump, it's the leaders of the party, it's some members of the Senate. Um, it's some local Republican leaders, it's Republican political columnists, and the very, very wealthy Fox News hosts. Um, there, is a, there is an elite group who see it as in their interests 
to undermine American democracy and make Americans fear that the election has been stolen. Um, so what I see is a competition between different kinds of elites. Hmm. Um, as I say, I see that one group has decided that democracy itself is now a tool that it can use against its political opponents. Excellent. No, uh, fair analysis and uh, an original point, so I appreciate that. Let's, uh, let's go to the second uh, quote from your, your recent book that I want to put to you. Um, so this kind of now pivots our conversation to thinking a little bit more about the future and where we go from here, because that's a big part of the Monk Dialogues. You say, quote, given the right conditions, any society can turn against democracy. Indeed, if history is anything to go by, all of our societies eventually will. I mean, that is a fascinating statement, and there's so much to unpack there. I, you know, help us lean into the future here. What, what are you saying? Are you saying that we're, we're at that fin de siècle moment, that, you know, the end is nigh? And, and if it is, what comes next? Is there a new reiteration of democracy? Is, is the, the rush towards populism and authoritarianism, in your view, possibly inevitable, it's too seductive, it's too hard to push back from? Give us a sense of where we go from here. So when I wrote that, um, my, my intention was not to say that there's something inevitable happening. Okay. Um, you know, that we, our democracy will die next week and there's nothing we can do about it. I didn't believe in historical inevitability at all and I don't believe that any country is ever condemned to any outcome. Um, everybody always has the possibility to make choices and make things different. Um, but I do think that all of us have forgotten, you know, given the incredible luck that we've enjoyed, we being we Americans, we Canadians, um, we Europeans, um, in the last several decades since the Second World War and even more so since the end of the Cold War, you know, we've enjoyed this incredible period of prosperity and expansion in which our societies were admired and copied by so many others, um, in which we became um, complacent about what our democracies were. And we've forgotten that most of the, uh, you know, the, 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 the founders of our democracies, this is particularly true in the United States, always had in the back of their heads the idea that democracy could fail. Um, so the founders who designed the U.S. Constitution, you know, the U.S. Constitution was not designed for an ideal world in which mm -hmm. all human beings are good, you know, and in which no bad people will ever appear. You know, it wasn't designed with this idea that Americans are somehow special or different or, or superhuman. You know, on the contrary, it was designed by people who feared, who, you know, who were reading the history of Greece and Rome, um, who knew that democracies had failed in the past, had very often turned into tyrannies, who were reading about you know, Caesar and the, and, and the fall of the Roman Republic, and who knew that a dictator or a tyrant or a demagogue could come along and, and upset the system. And the rules of American democracy, some of which are pretty anachronistic today and can seem pretty weird, um, those were all written the way they were written because the founders wanted to prevent... Um, demagogues from coming to power. So, so the, the, the point is that I wanted to remind people that this has always been the case. You know, American democracy has always been, you know, it could, has always been potentially, it was always possible to overthrow it. And it was overthrown once in the past. I mean, that's what, you know, well, that's what the Civil War was. A, a, a portion of um, some of the American states seceded from the Union because they didn't want to um, adhere to the will of the majority, and they feared that the election of President Lincoln meant that they would have to end um, slavery, and they didn't want, um, and they objected. Um, and so the, you know, the, the idea that, there, you know, that there's something new about democracy being fragile, or that democracy you know, has never been under challenge like this before, I mean, that's just ahistorical. Um, and the point is, is that our, all of our democracies do need this kind of constant vigilance. You know, we all need this sense all the time that unless we pay attention, unless we're on our toes, um, unless we all stay engaged, um, unless, unless democracy is real. I mean, one of the, one of the you know, this is um, in reference also to your early question about elites. It is true that over the last several decades, many people have begun to feel as if politics were something that was done by some experts, you know, mm -hmm. some people over there in Washington or in, I don't know, Sacramento or in, or in, um, you know, in, in, in Albany. And, and it was just something that people did, uh, you know, in secret in rooms and all that we as American citizens were ever required to do was show up every four years and vote for somebody. 
Um, actually, it turns out that it's really important to be engaged in politics all the time. Um, and at least you know, that, that it's important to be part of parties, that parties can't be allowed to atrophy, um, that it's important to be part of movements, it's important to be a poll worker, it's important to be engaged. Um, and the the need to keep people engaged and to and to and 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 to um, to make sure that people understand what's going on in democracy is just is greater than ever. Um, but unless we have that sense that democracy could be in danger and is indeed always in danger, that you know, unless we're all engaged, it could fall apart. Um, then I think we you know then we run we do run real risks that it will. So so that that quote was not a prediction. It was just a statement of fact. Most democracies have failed. Um, ours could fail too. And you know, pay attention, be involved, mm -hmm. um, do do what you can uh, in order to prevent that. Yeah, that's a really uh, important message. Thank you, and I want to remind uh, viewers that uh, we will take your questions uh, for and this hour. You can email them to dialogues at monkdebates.com. Again, that message, dialogue at monkdebates.com. And also to remind uh, Monk members watching that we will have a, a post-dialogue members only Q&A with the Globe and Mail's Doug Saunders. Uh, he's been an international uh, affairs and international relations correspondent for the paper. He's gonna bring a Canadian perspective on this conversation that we're having with Anne. So that's coming up. Uh, a little after the top of the hour with Doug Saunders. And again, you can go to our website if you're not a member and register now, monkdebates.com forward slash uh, membership. We'll also post a registration link uh, for those of you watching in Facebook uh, right now on the, uh, the chat function. So again, join uh, as a member and be part of, for free of that uh, post dialogue conversation. Now back to Anne, the final uh, quote board, Anne, I want to put to you before we go to uh, audience questions is, is the following, uh, quote, many fear, maybe fear of the disease will create fear of freedom or maybe the coronavirus will inspire a new sense of global solidarity. We have to accept that both these futures are possible. And you kind of finished this, this book and you're thinking uh, uh, in its pages as this uh, pandemic began to ravage the world where are you at, uh, you know, uh, a period of time now later in terms of that, that tension between how this coronavirus will impact democracy? We've seen a fascinating range of responses in terms of uh, public health and the suppression of this virus in democracies versus autocracies. It's, it's a mixed record, frankly, on, in both camps, but I'd be fascinated to know how you think uh, COVID-19 will, will impact the future trajectory both of democracy and of authoritarianism and populism. It's, re it's really interesting actually because, I mean, I think all of us can see that as the virus goes on and as it takes different forms and there are different kinds of impacts, um, one's assessment of it ha you know, necessarily changes. Um, you know, certainly at the beginning, at the initial phase of this, um, it, it looked like it was going to be a good moment for autocracy or, or more, more, perhaps more accurately for, um, for illiberal leaders in democracy. So anybody, you know, anybody who wanted, who shut their borders, who shut things down, um, who, who, who immediately reasserted, you know, created emergency law was initially very popular. Um, those kinds of measures were in the first phase of the virus seen as as necessary and good. And and you know, look, going back through human history, I I, I wrote something about this in at last spring. You know, pandemics and and terrible ways of disease almost always revol rev end with an expansion of the power of the state. Um, and because when people are afraid, they are willing to exchange their freedom. Um, in response for, um, you know, in response for a feeling of safety. Um, but this is a modern era, and oddly enough, as the pandemic has progressed and as it's taken different forms in different places, something a little bit more, one has to, you know, something a little bit different emerged. Um, and that is that, um, in, you know, in the modern world, one of the things that people want out of the pandemic um, again, they want safety. And as many people began to turn to science and to expertise um, as, the, as the font of, you know, as, as the source of safety and the source of solutions for this pandemic, um, 
in a lot of places, these liberal language and nationalist language began to wear pretty thin. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, as the, you know, if you, if you take a step back and you look, you know, more generally at countries that have done better or worse, um, the ones that have done better are not necessarily democracies or autocracies. Um, the ones that have done better are the ones where there's a lot of trust um, in the state um, and in particularly in the public health bureaucracy, um, where there's uh, where scientists have been allowed to play an important role in controlling the virus, um, where so-called populist or um, you know or or anti-science or um, you know or or, or anti-state movements haven't haven't made huge progress. Um, and so actually what we see is that what matters isn't even your political system. It's, the, it's, it's questions like about trust, about science, about truth, about reality. Again, is your political system one where people are still discussing reality? Are they still discussing, you know, real events and still attempting to use, I mean, again, science hasn't presented us with all the answers, but where people are trying to use scientific method to understand where it's going on, or are you, are you in the realm of, of fantasy and, and, and game playing and culture wars? Um, and the, to the extent that your state is one that's in the former group, um, you're more likely um, to, to, to have done better. I mean, it may be that a little bit further down the road, one of the impacts, um, particularly as we get vaccines and as people begin to see them working, um, one of the impacts of the coronavirus might be a longer term respect for science um, and a respect for political leaders who who try to adhere to science. Um, I mean, I hope I hope that's that's what's going to happen. Um, but you can but the but the the battle lines aren't as 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 clearly drawn as as many would like them to be. I mean, even the even the question of China, which is a complicated one, mm. because the Chinese have controlled the virus for the most part um, inside their country. Uh, you know, you then you have to take a step back and ask, um, you know, well, the you know the origins of the virus lie in China. Um, China lied about the virus at the very beginning and tried to repress the doctors and scientists who were who were writing about it initially. Um, and so even the even the record of successful states shows that you know successful autocracy shows that you know shows that autocracy is not a solution to this you know by any means. Um, the, the solutions, you know, seem to lie, as, as I say, in trust, in, in public health, um, in social solidarity, um, and in and in states where people are willing to listen to, um, are more interested anyway in engaging with facts rather than mythology. Before I go to questions, Anne, I've got to ask you uh, about Russia. Uh, you have been a, a long-term observer of Russia. You've written a number of books about Russian uh, history. Uh, Russia has been a a meddler, to, to put it mildly, in um, the fate and future of democracy in Europe and around the world, if we look back at the 2016 U.S. election. How has this coronavirus affected uh, the government of Vladimir Putin, their authority and their ability to, uh, frankly, continue to potentially be a threat to uh, Western liberal democracy. Is this a setback? Is Putin weathering the storm? Uh, what is your assessment? So remember that Russia's threat to us is not a military threat or not necessarily. I mean, may, he, he may be a military threat to some of his immediate neighbors. Um, Russia's status, you know, threat to us was always um, in the realm of disinformation, in the realm of corruption, um, in the realm of political meddling, of you know the buying and selling of, of politicians and of political parties inside some inside some democracies, and much of that continues. Um, you know, I've seen some evidence that shows Russian links to anti-vaccine material, for example, and this actually goes back dates back to before the coronavirus. Um, so the, the Russians are interested in pushing anti-science, anti-rationality. Um, uh, you know, th those kinds of narratives in all of our countries. Um, and I have no doubt that they're still doing this now. I mean, I, I suppose the unexpected part of the story is that the American president has been pushing anti-vaccine, anti-science um, messaging as well. And his, you know, as a, as, a, as a source of disinformation inside the United States and actually around the world in general, he's actually more powerful. I mean, I think he's probably done more damage in that in the realm of disinformation, um, certainly in the in the last year um, than the Russians have. 
Um, I mean, look down the road. Russia is a economically, um, you know, a weakened state. The coronavirus has also, you know, caused huge levels of distrust of the state there. Um, there's a lot of bad information in Russia, actually. It's, it's not even that clear. Um, initially, um, the, the virus's initial hit in, in some big Russian cities was covered up. It was unclear what was happening to a lot of people. You know, there were stories about flu and pneumonia um, rather than the virus. So I imagine that it will also have the impact in Russia that's had in other places of creating more distrust for the state and more and more sense of um, you know you know more people having a sense of that that uh, you know that the that the state is illegitimate. But taking a step back, as I say, the what was Russia what was Russia good at? What did Russia teach Western politicians? It was good at this undermining of narratives, undermine faith in democracy, undermine faith in science. Um, undermine faith in education, you know, all those things. Um, and, and they continue. It's just that, um, you know, this, the, those kinds of narratives are now so strong inside our own democracies that I don't know that the Russian ones matter as much as they used to. Great, and that's a perfect segue to start going to uh, audience questions. And just to remind viewers, you can uh, email your question that I'll put to Anne. Uh, we have a lot of them coming in to dialogues at monkdebates.com. And the first question comes from uh, Dan Monroe. He's asking, uh, Barack Obama has been quoted as saying, if we do not have the capacity to distinguish what is true from what is false, then by definition, the marketplace of ideas doesn't work. By definition, our democracy doesn't work. So Dan is asking you, do you agree with Obama's characterization that democracy flat out isn't working? So I read that Obama statement as meaning if this comes to be true, in other words, if we can't have a conversation that's about reality, then democracy won't work. I'm not sure he was saying it's all over already. Um, and knowing him and, and, and having read that whole interview, I, 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 think, I think that's the best way to interpret it. But, but I certainly agree with the, the, the basic idea, and it's close to what you, what you and I started talking about at the beginning of this conversation, which is that um, democracy depends on there being some kind of, I mean, marketplace of ideas is maybe not a great expression, but some kind of neutral um, ground, you know, that there is um, some, some agreed upon facts um, in which we can all have different opinions. We can have a right-wing opinion or a left-wing opinion or a green opinion or a, or a libertarian opinion, but nevertheless, we all agree what the facts are and we agree what the problem is. It's just that we have different answers to it or different solutions. Um, when we start all having different facts and when we can therefore no longer have a debate about how to solve the problem, um, then it does get to be hard to see how democracy works. Um, and this is why the idea of the reconstruction of the public sphere or um, you know, some of the experiments that are being done in, 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 in a number of countries about looking for new ways to unite people or create online or offline, um, conversations with people are so important because we are losing, um, you know, we are losing the public sphere. We are losing the right. but, place but where Anna, we can have a neutral debate. I guess what what's on my mind and maybe many readers' minds, and I think we appreciate that you're a person who engages in straight talk here, What what's the potential really for that kind of rebuilding, for that reinforcing to incur when on the other side you've got as you mentioned, you know, Vladimir Putin's Russia uh, actively interfering. You have Facebook, Twitter, these massive multi-billion dollar uh, companies that have created this, uh, this new and at times frightening information kind of ecosystem. I mean, th these just seem like massive monumental forces kind of wrenching uh, our democracy apart. Why do we think that you know, coffee clutches and people vol volunteering, you know, at polling stations is, is really anything other than putting a, you know, a finger in the dike. No, I mean, I, no, I, I, I didn't mean to say that, you know, grassroots political organizing was going to fix every problem. Um, um, look, I mean, this is probably, a, you know, someday I hope you and I will have a longer conversation about this. I mean, I, I am really interested in the question of um, it's not so much social media regulation, but internet regulation, um, and um, that can be done not just in the United States, but in conjunction with other democracies that would look very deeply at the question of what do we want a democratic internet to look like? So we, we know already 
um, what the autocratic internet looks like because China has created it. We mm-hmm. know what the Chinese have done. They've they've used all the technologies, the nudging, the um, the, 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 the the manipulation, and they've used it to create a, a, a Chinese internet, um, which gives the government more control and a more ability to monitor the population. What do we want the liberal democratic internet to look like? We've never really had that conversation. Um, we've let it be determined by private companies, um, by some you know historical accident, um, and we haven't you know we haven't thought as societies what we want to do about it. And it is, I agree. And by and by this, by the way, I didn't mean censorship, or you know the question of what should or shouldn't be taken down. I mean much more more fundamental questions yeah. about. Um, you know, the company, you know, what power the company should have, how big they should be, questions about anonymity, um, questions about transparency, questions about who, who decides what the algorithms are. Um, and I do think, you know, a friend of mine recently who, who's, a, who's involved in, in, in financial markets said to me recently, you know, she had been thinking about, well, look, there, there, is, a, there is an analogy. You know, there are, there's the world of capital markets in which billions of dollars slosh around the world every day and and huge fortunes are at stake and everybody is trying to cheat everybody else <laughs> you know and yet we manage to we manage to regulate it you know right. there are regulations and people abide by them um and that's a i'm not saying that's a model <laughs> yeah. for the internet but it's a way of thinking about it I right. mean, we, we're not powerful we, we're not there's these are these are new these are very still very new technologies um and we haven't really grappled with the idea of how to make them work for us rather than le- allowing them to divide us. But I, I don't think it's an impossible problem, although I agree that it's a it's a longer term conversation. Oh, that's great. Um, I want to get a question up on the board here from Will Douglas. Uh, this is a question that was emailed in earlier. Uh, quote, uh, I regularly encounter people who show a hearty disdain for any effort to unearth and prove a link between Donald Trump's campaign and foreign, pol- and foreign policy to various strategies and tactics of the Putin government. What has been your experience in this? And, and, and give us your reaction as, uh, as Will. And I, I think, and this is maybe an interesting jumping point for you to talk a little bit about, you know, the fact that in writing this book and in your other kind of public speaking and uh, advocacy, you know, you've really had some fallings out with, with, you know, fellow ideological travelers of the past who, who you now see as being, you know, in a, in an alternative universe and, and they in turn, uh, you know, see you as, as someone that in their view is not uh, a credible advocate for either the interests of Poland or the interests of the United States or, or the interests of, of the Western order. I mean, talk to us a little bit about how how this is, has become personal for you. Um, I mean, that's that's a slightly different from what I understood the question to be. Sure. Um, but I'm but play, I'm happy to play along with me <laughs> uh, to, 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 to answer it. Um, I mean, yeah. Look, I mean, one of the effects of the of the events of the last four, five, six years has been that the broad camp of people who used to consider themselves center-right um, has divided. And this is true in a lot of countries. This is true in Poland, you know, which is where I live part of the time. It's true in the US, which is where I'm from. It's true in the UK, which is where I spent many years and, and was worked for, for a long time. Um, and it's true in many other countries. Um, it's true in Spain. It's true, in, um, it's true to some extent in Germany. I mean, so there you can, you can see this division in the right in a lot of places. Um, and you know, a part of the center right, um, or what used to be the center right or the anti-communist right in some in, in, in Eastern Europe or the Reaganite right or the Thatcherite right, however you want to describe it, um, a part of the, you know, a part of that grouping still sees itself as part of a big um, uh, you know, international coalition which is pro-democracy and which believes in um, in in working together with allies against enemies and so on, and then part of that group has gone off in a more radical direction, um, and they have turned to, you know, to from from my interpretation, they've turned against many of the things that they used to believe in. And one of the odder things that's happened, I mean, really odd, um, is that a number of them have decided that rather than being you know pro NATO and pro American and pro Canadian and and pro this grand um, alliance of Western democracies, um, they prefer to be pro-Russian. Mm-hmm. Um, 
and 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 they you know they they have you know they go along with Putin's anti-democratic language. They um, they accept his critique of Western democracy as 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 fake and um, you know and and ineffective. Um, they 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 agree with the tactics that he's used to try and undermine democracy in in a number of places. And you know my original objection to Donald Trump um, long before he became president. Um, was that he, you know, from the from the from the beginning of his campaign, he was using, you know, language that came from, um, you know, from from Russian sources. I mean, he was he accused. There was a moment during the campaign where he accused Hillary Clinton of being of having Obama of having founded ISIS, of Hillary Clinton wanting to start World War III, and these were all tropes and comments and ideas that were coming directly from um, Russian propaganda. Um, and so from the beginning, I, I saw him as somebody who identified himself um, with that anti-democratic, that cynical, um, you know, that, that, that way of seeing the world. Um, and it was, has been very shocking to me that not everybody, but a few people in the general world of, you know, I don't know, Republican or conservative or Tory um, politics um, took up those same kinds of lines. And, and what what is that? I mean, what leads people down that rabbit hole? I mean, is it a is it a, just a kind of an abandonment of of the ideals of democracy in their own society? Is it is it just a sense that the system isn't working for them and and a kind of victim men mentality. I mean, you're right. It really is a 180 degree turn from people to go from being, you know, a Reagan Republican to, you know, a Putin pundit on Fox News. So usually, I mean, this is this is actually the the topic of my book. I mean, that is the, that's the question that the book sought to solve. Um, it's not it's not really a book about voters. In fact, it's not a book at all about voters. It's not really about why people vote for Trump or, or um, you know, in that sense, and nor is it really a book about Trump. It's not about the leaders. It's about the, um, it's about the conservative writers, journalists, intellectuals, political strategists, um, and why they changed and why they switched camps um, and why they, why they made the decisions they did. And, and I don't have a single answer. I, there isn't one explanation. Um, the only thing that I would say that links a lot of the different people who I profile in the book um, is a profound sense of disappointment. Um, hmm. They are disappointed with the societies they live in. In some cases, it's to do with demographic change or social changes that they don't like. Um, in some cases, it's to do with a, a feeling of moral decline, um, very similar to the kinds of feeling of moral decline that people have had in rapidly changing societies right. in the past. I mean, one of the things about all of our societies is that we are living through a period of really just unbelievably rapid change mm -hmm. um, in everything, economics, culture, you know, social mores, um, as well as information. Um, and in, in the course of that rapid change, things do get lost or forgotten or left behind. And there are people for whom you know, who, who feel that element things were lost or things they remember from their childhood or their past in, about their societies have disappeared. So they're not wrong in many cases to say that something has changed irrevocably. Um, but, this, but this feeling of disappointment or in some cases nostalgia um, in some time, sometimes becomes very acute, um, so right. much so that it becomes not just disappointment but actual anger and despair. Um, and once you are at that point, once you believe that your society is dead or dying or finished or ending, this is when you become radical. Um, mm -hmm. Because if it's dead or dying, then you might as well smash it all up and start again. Um, and this is the origin, by the way, of left-wing radicalism mm -hmm. as well as right-wing right radicalism. Right. Um, deep disappointment, anger, uh, cynicism about the system, belief that it can't work, that it's no longer serving people. And then, as I say, and I use a few examples in the book, in some cases, this is connected with people's personal disappointment. You know, I should be doing better or I should be doing something different or, or, this, or this, this political system has kept me back. So there's, there's some, sometimes it's personal as well, but I will, I will give, I will give that group the, um, you know, the, 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 you know, I will, I will say that for many of them, it's not just personal, it is ideological. They think 
our societies are dead and therefore any radical change, however destructive, um, can be forgiven. Yeah, three, I mean, three observations about that. One, it's very close to Putin's view of the West uh, as a dead, decadent society. Mm -hmm. I think your word nostalgia is absolutely uh, key to understanding this as the kind of the perception, the mourning of a lost order. And, and I think then this creation of a kind of, the existing order is something that's other um, and can be subjected to ruthless you know, criticism and, as you say, uh, potentially destruction to create something new. It's a fascinating, fascinating and, I think, uh, genuinely perceptive analysis. Let's go, uh, just to build on this, we've got a, a conversation here, a uh, question here from Jonathan Mertz, who's uh, asking us online, given the lack of a clear positive political direction and its largely decentralized structure, do you think this new brand of populist authoritarianism is capable of building a new political order, or is it, again, purely, as you are just discussing, Anne, you know, just about tearing down a kind of nihilistic uh, uh, engagement with, with what is before us? So the answer depends, um, and the answer depends on what happens when these kinds of populist political parties take power. Um, you know, look at, um, in 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 Poland. Uh, 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 again, populist is not a word I love, but I'll go on using it because people um, people seem to intuitively understand what it means. I, I would call them anti-pluralist or anti-democratic parties. But but in Poland, a populist party took power um, and immediately set about trying to undermine the independent court system. So there was an illegal assault on the constitutional tribunal. Um, there was a takeover of state media. Um, there was a takeover of a whole range of other kinds of institutions, a um, destruction of the civil service, of the diplomatic service. Um, and all of those changes um, gave the ruling party all kinds of political advantages um, and made it, um, you know, gave it a, a you know, lasting power um, that, that makes it much more difficult to dislodge. Um, and the same is often true if you look at these kinds of populist parties in other countries, you look at Turkey. Um, Erdogan's party, um, why is it still in power? Well, partly because it's eliminated sometimes or, or arrested or jailed its opponents because it's made it harder to function as an opposition, you know, in the opposition. Um, the same can be said of Viktor Orban's Hungary, where um, some, you know, I think it's over 90% of the media is controlled one way or another by, by the ruling party. Um, so once these kinds of parties take over, they can harm and undermine and alter institutions so that they don't lose again. And that is the purpose. I mean, that's why they're doing it. I mean, the, you know, what's happening in the United States this week is a little farcical. Um, but the purpose of seeking to overthrow the votes of people in Michigan, the purpose of that is to take power and to keep power right. and keep the presidency, even though Donald Trump has lost it. Um, and in, there are a lot of countries where that's been done more effectively. It's actually harder to do in the United States because our federal system is, makes it, you know, it's, it's, you know and, and for other reasons, it's, 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 it's more difficult. But in a centralized um, country, I mean, taking over the levers of power and eliminating the kind of, you know, the, the, the possibility that an opposition party could, could someday unseat the ruling party. I mean, this isn't. This can be done a lot more easily. So, I mean, I mean, this is the end game. This is the reason these parties do what they do. It's not just to be disruptive and wreck things. Although in many cases, that's the, that's why people go along with it. Um, the reason ultimately is then to re to establish power, to promote a new elite, or that you know, and to create a a new kind of political system. And we do see in in a few countries mm. that this it's working. Yeah, it's a fascinating analysis, and in that point about a new elite is absolutely key. This is not a, a kind of democratic revolution of, of the people for the people. We had a question emailed in by uh, previously by David Bork. He's asking, uh, what do you think of Klaus Schwab's Great Reset? This is Klaus Schwab, the I presume the head of the World Economic uh, Forum. Uh, David goes on, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau uh, appears to similarly embrace the idea of a sweeping reworking of the existing social economic and international order. Um, and let, just have you reflect on this idea that is emerging, again, in certain elite circles, that this pandemic and maybe the continuing after effects of the great financial crisis require a much bigger set of international and domestic political 
and social reforms, a real reworking of the social and international and economic order. I mean, is that just kind of, uh, I don't know, Davos uh, palaver, or you know, is there an idea there that needs to be considered seriously, and then is it at all realistic? So I think it's true that the pandemic has given a lot of people the feeling that there are deep things wrong in our societies, um, and that simply finding the vaccine won't cure them. Um, the pandemic has made, you know, that clearly one of the economic impacts of the pandemic has been to make inequality deeper. Um, it's shown the importance of all kinds of, um, whether hospital workers or even, you know, grocery store workers or, or people who work in delivery companies, we, the importance of people who are living in very precarious ways in many of our societies. And it made it clear that the um, you know that 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 you know it's in, that how how just how unfair um, our systems are, and so people are hoping that um, that the pandemic will bring about some real changes. I mean, one of the things I'm most afraid of is that in fact the pandemic will bring about very little change because simply people will have the feeling of you know we're just scrabbling out of a hole um, in order to get back to where we were before. Um, I mean, you know, I mean it's. One of the things I'm hoping that happens with the Biden administration um, is that when, when it takes over, um, it has a close look at some of the international and other institutions that have failed, both during the pandemic and, and previously, um, and that it does um, begin some deeper thinking about how we, particularly about how we can renew our alliances, um, how democracies can work together. I mean, for example, on some of the issues we've just talked about, how they can work together on um, rethinking you know, how we use the internet, um, whether they can work together on climate change, whether they can work together on, uh, on pub, you know, big international public health issues, um, whether we can come up with more democratic answers as an as a, as a, as a international community. I mean, Demo you know, European, Asian, American and other democracies, how we can push back against the pressure from Russia and China, how we can how we can answer some of those things as a community rather than doing it each one on our own. I mean, those are the things that I hope will come out of it. Um, but I am uh, I'm just I'm I'm I am um, skeptical of too much idealism, um, mm -hmm. and I'm also skeptical of the ability that people are going to have, particularly in the next few months, to make any big and very creative changes, given how much catching up there is to do. But I guess I agree with the premise of the question, which is that, yes, I do think um, the pandemic and other things, and really the Trump presidency, frankly, um, revealed that there are a lot of our institutions, both domestic and international, are a lot weaker um, than we thought they were, and they are in need of pretty deep repair. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, going to squeeze in a couple more questions here before we get to your uh, book recommendations, Anne, on uh, what you think people should be reading to understand this moment. So David Wang has uh, emailed in asking, and again, this builds on our conversation about Joe Biden, bearing in mind the recent results of the American election uh, and Joe Biden's uh, presumptive victory, do you think the appeal of populism in America has waned? Uh, does this mean the threat to democracy from populist leaders is, is waning at all? I mean, and help us think forward here, possibly to 2024 in the United States. Uh, you know, has this been the dunamont of, of kind of populist politics? I mean, you could make an argument that that did happen in Europe over the last number of years, that the populist surge was pushed back in, in the mainline European states of Germany, France, uh, maybe not Spain with the rise of the Vox Party as the third most powerful party now, but what, what, what's your view? Is this American election a bit of a bellwether in terms of the future direction of the struggle between liberal democracy and populism? So look, we, we now live in a, in a world in which politics is international, whether we want it to be or not. And Joe Biden's election will have an impact on the international populist movement or the international nationalist movement, strange though that sounds. Um, from a lot, you know, there are a lot of people in political parties um, in Europe and all over the world, who found inspiration from Trump and who, um, and in some cases, were, were were welcomed by him or by his ambassadors, and and felt empowered by by the fact that he was there. And certainly, the presence of a very different kind of American president will will dampen 
um, some of that enthusiasm. Um, but I don't think that the that the that this that the era is over. Um, and I do think that different forms of populism, they may be left-wing populism, they may be other other forms of right-wing populism, um, will come back. I mean, one one of the one of the one of the things that we've also learned from from the Trump experience is that the ease with which false visions of reality and um, conspiracy theories can now be propagated and spread and used by politicians um, is unsurpassed. I mean, there's never been a historical moment like this. Uh, the U.S. president um, declares that the election was rigged with no evidence, um, mm -hmm. with no winning no legal cases. Um, and yet, um, as of today, something like half of American Republicans believe that that might be true. Um, and as long as that you know, as long as those kinds of um, false narratives are so easy to spread, be, you know, so, so easy to believe mm -hmm. and so easy to spread, um, I think that it will be, it will go on being possible to create, um, uh, you know, create divisive movements around them. Okay, and I, I want to uh, just squeeze and uh, get a quick answer here, just because it's a great question, and uh, uh, then we'll get to your, your, uh, your book recommendations for us. It's from Richard uh, Christensen, uh, he's asking, there are so many threats to democracy across the world. Populism, authoritarianism appear to become entrenched in several countries. What are some behaviors and activities that the average citizen can do to help democracy survive? I think that's a great question to end on. You gave us a sense earlier in this conversation of, of some of those activities, but maybe just go a bit deeper for us. What practically can we do to help uh, our liberal democratic values and institutions not just survive but hopefully flourish in this period that you rightly describe of rapid, urgent, challenging uh, change? First of all, all of us should remember that nowadays all of us are publishers and all of us are editors mm -hmm. and all of us are journalists. So the first thing to do is to make sure that whatever it is that you're doing on social media is is useful make sure that what you repeat and say is is based on some some kind of reporting um and and you know and make sure that you are always seeking to reach out to people on the other side as well um uh, in your personal life find people who you disagree with and and try and talk to them i mean i think the you know one of the things that we're all going to have to try and find ways to do is 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 bridge this you know these deep gaps created by polarization and accelerated by social media and by politicians in whose interest it is um, to keep people divided. So I think in a personal way, you know, whether you're online or offline, um, you can you can help to bridge those gaps yourself. Secondly, I would say join a political party, um, be part of a local election, um, whether it's for the school board or the county sheriff, or it doesn't really matter. It doesn't have to be a national election. Um, try and participate in the political process yourself locally. Um, you know, the more people who are involved and the more grounded, um, um, you know, civic-minded people who are involved in the process, um, the better. Uh, and that's something that, you know, again, that, 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 that everybody, did, you know, can do. I mean, beyond that, I mean, there is, you know, there are lots and lots of initiatives that promote civic education, mm -hmm. um, that, pro that promote democratic conversation. I mean, this look, this monk dialogues is, is, a, is an institution that sought to bring different kinds of people together and, and make them talk. But there are many others. Um, I'm connected to one. It's called the Renew Democracy Initiative. Um, there's another called Braver Angels. Um, look around and find in your community or find online, you know, one of, you know, a group that seeks to propagate and talk about and and enhance um, civic conversation. Um, I think that, you know, that's the, and there, you know, Protect Democracy is another one. It's a very good American group, which has been involved recently in some of the, some of the lawsuits defending people who are counting the votes. Um, you know, find people who are doing something that you admire and support them. I mean, whether it doesn't have to be giving them money, but sign up for their yep. newsletters, uh, take part in their events. Um, participate yourself. I mean, I think that, um, you know, that, you know, voting, get, getting your friends to vote. Um, I think those are the, those are kind of the basic activities that almost any citizen can do. That's a great point. We're not powerless. We have agency. Uh, we can affect change. Um, and you've been so generous with your time. I just want to leave uh, our viewers with the benefit of 
three books that we've asked all of our Monk uh, Dialogue participants to, to come to these conversations with three book recommendations. Anne's going to give us a quick precis of each. The first, Anne, is How Democracies Die. So this is a book that became a classic over the last several years. It's by, it's by two academics um, who are both experts in the question of how democracies deteriorate. And their main point is that, although we all have in our head the picture of the military coup and you know, the, the colonel on the tank, actually most democracies die in the way that you and I have been discussing through an assault on and an undermining of, of democratic institutions. And this is a book that goes through some of the recent histories, um, through some familiar examples, Venezuela, um, Turkey, you know, some of the ones that, I, that I've mentioned, um, and also points out how the weakening of some institutions in the United States does leave the US open to a similar kind of assault on, on, on democratic institutions as well. So it's, a, it's actually a very, it's a short and very easy to read book that will give you both some history and some background um, to this, to the to the conversation of why democracies decline. Excellent. Your next book was uh, "Nothing Is True and Everything Is Possible." Yeah. So this is maybe a little more eccentric, um, given the conversation. This is a this is actually a book about Russia by my colleague Peter Pomerantsev. Um, and what's interesting about it is that he was he lived in Russia for a number of years and watched how the Russian government transformed its information and propaganda system from one that was, I mean, if not liberal, then very fairly open. There were different kinds of ideas still being discussed and how it eventually took over the system and created the more virulent forms of, um, of, of anti-democratic propaganda that we see today. And it's simply because he dissects it from the background and he, and he explains how it came about um, I think it's a really good, you know, if you're trying to understand modern authoritarian propaganda and what is it, exactly what is it that the Russians are doing and why are they creating fake Facebook groups and why are they seeking to inspire conflict and why are they supporting anti-vax movements, um, this book will give you the background and the history that, that explains all of that. Excellent. And your final book uh, is These Truths by uh, Jill Lepore. So this is, a, this is a long, I will not hide the fact, it's a long, thick mm -hmm. history of America, of the United States, um, a one volume history. Um, and what's really, what I, what I loved about this history book, and there, are, and there, are a lot of, there are a lot of interesting things about it, but it seeks to combine um, many narratives. So it is neither a history of the United States as a, you know, one great triumph from beginning to the end, nor is it a kind of the United States is horrible and always has been from the beginning to the end. Um, it's really a history of American aspirations. Um, and it begins with the idea and ideals of democracy, um, where they came from, why they were so potent in the, in the, in the 18th century on the East Coast of the United States, um, and then how they spread and, and how they um, expanded um, and how they changed and, and uh, over time, and it's just a, if you if you're if you're feeling like um, somewhat lost in your understanding of you know there's so much political argument going on you know Democrats Republicans um, if you want just to sit back and think about how did we get here you know what how did we begin this is a very even tempered synthesis you know a, a history of the United States that is not left wing it's not right wing it's not traditionalist it's not it's not revisionist, it's, a, it's simply an attempt to show the history of the idea of America and how it's evolved. And I think really anybody would find it a useful read. Excellent. Well, I just want to remind uh, viewers that you can get all those books plus Anne's latest and her, her other titles at our book publisher, bookseller, indigo.ca. Uh, just uh, look for the Monk Debates microstore on the indigo.ca website. There's uh, Anne's four great books. I recommend them all. Gulag, Iron Curtain, Red Famine, and of course, what we've been talking about today, The Twilight of Democracy. And I really want to thank you uh, for this dialogue. You know, I kind of entered this conversation uh, pessimistic and confused, uh, like many are, I think, about the future of democracy. You've, you've left me with uh, a sense of, of flickering hope, uh, maybe more, and more importantly, I think a sense of agency. Um, we're not, uh, we're not without choices, decisions that we can make in our individual lives to, uh, 
to continue to steward and foster something that has just been vital to our prosperity, our freedom, uh, so much that we value in our lives. So I want to thank you for leading that conversation globally and for everything that you do and for being part of this conversation today. Thank you, Rudyard. I really appreciate it. Um, all your events are so well done, and this one was no exception. So thanks for organizing. Okay. Be well. We'll talk to you soon. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Ann Applebaum on uh, This Monk Dialogue. Uh, I want to remind viewers that we're going to start just in a matter of moments. Our members-only uh, post-dialogue Q&A with Doug Saunders of The Globe and Mail. Uh, there's still time for you to sign up for a free Monk membership to join that dialogue, which will be kicking off in about five minutes. Just go to our website, monkdebates.com forward slash membership, and we'll automatically email you a link uh, to join uh, the Q&A with Doug Saunders, where we'll talk about the Canadian dimension of uh, the fate and future of democracy internationally. How is this impacting Canada, our values, our institutions, all that coming up in a matter of minutes. And also to remind you of our dialogue next week. Next Wednesday, we have Zhang Weiwei. Uh, he's one of China's leading academics and thinkers about uh, the rise of China. Um, it's going to be uh, a challenging conversation. Uh, you're going to get a genuine Chinese perspective on how they see the fate and future of their own social order, and more importantly, uh, their criticism of uh, what they see as the defects, the defaults of uh, Western liberal democracy. That was Zhang Weiwei next Wednesday, direct from Shanghai at, uh, at 8 p.m. Eastern. Finally, I just want to thank the great group of partners and uh, sponsors who make all of these dialogues possible. First and foremost, the Peter and Melanie Monk Charitable Foundation, who are the driving force behind everything here at the Dialogues and the Monk Debates. Our two presenting sponsors, Onyx and Gluskin Chef, thank you both. Our great team of supporting sponsors, Tories LLP, Bond Brand Loyalty, and Cassette Media, and all of our distribution partners who take these dialogues uh, across North America and around the world in video and audio, from CPAC to GEM to Facebook to Indigo to uh, WNED, NPR Buffalo, to Canada's National Newspaper, to the Globe and Mail, and uh, to Antica, our podcast uh, producer. So thank you all. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being part of this conversation. Uh, thank you for opening your minds to difficult and challenging issues and ideas. That's what the Monk Dialogues is all about. And it's what we'll do again next Wednesday with your company. Thank you. We'll talk to you soon.